Come on, come on, that's good. And right up the middle now, because we're right up the centre. If you can stay on this, it's easier. Keep coming. A winter's day in Aldershot, 1976. Three young men with their trainers prepare for the supreme test of the Olympic Games. Soon, Peter, Mike and Graham will leave for the snow-covered hills of northern Sweden to compete in the 10-kilometre and the 15-kilometre cross-country ski races. But there's still plenty of hard work to be done. And what makes it even harder is that Peter and Mike and Graham are totally blind. Straight. Come on, stride out. Well done. Go on. Got lots of run out. Go on, that's good. Mike's 25. He was blinded by a firework when he was 10 years old. The firework went off and I was sort of thrown to the floor and there was blood pouring everywhere. But I could still see at that time. And I just thought I'd cut myself badly. So when they went to hospital, then woke up with pads on my eyes. And I think that was probably the most frightening sort of time. And suddenly not to be able to see what you're eating and sort of people poking feeding mugs in your mouth with sort of foul tasting rubbish that you didn't really know what you're eating in your mouth and things like that was was really frightening and, and sort of having to sort of go to the toilet in bed and all sorts of things that you know 11 you know it was embarrassing I, I was 10 and a half I was you know embarrassed at all the people coming around and bed baths and and you just didn't know what was happening you didn't know where you were your environment or anything that's good that's good Graham's 23 He's been blind since he was a baby. I keep going. Keep going. I don't really feel it much. I've never experienced sight. Good. Now keep the so, body up. Um, That's right. Sight is something that I can't imagine, really. So being blind is just normal to me. So I don't really feel... I don't know, I suppose I don't really feel blind because I feel normal. Good, good, good. Peter's 20. He too has never known what it is to be able to see. I've got no recollections of seeing anything at all. No colours, no moving things, nothing. I mean, apart from the fact I can't read and I can't drive, there's nothing else I've not done. Nothing? Well, you know, the odd thing, I've not climbed Everest and things like that. I mean, they're just... You've got to generalise, but obviously I've not done climbing Everest, you know. But most of the other things I've done. I used to go scrumming as a kid. Um, it didn't stop me doing that. Well run, well done, well done. The three boys who live in Essex train on Sundays at this 400 metre circuit at Aldershot. Every Sunday, it's a three hour journey there and three hours back. Have a little rest for a moment. Yeah. You can listen to... Um, Colonel John Moore trains them. He's head of the Army Physical Training School. He's preparing them for the first ever Winter Olympics for the disabled. About loosening the muscles and shaking out the calves. Now, his idea is when he runs, it's got to sort of... From his words, they have to build the picture of how best to cope with the course. Now, he's going to run noisier than normal, so you can hear him. Did you hear that? On a turn like this, you can lose 30 seconds. How do you see the turn? You've got to listen uh, to, the, to your person to guide you. But <laughs> just now, Peter did it, and Graham's done it twice very fast. Mike, I would say, has got tremendous determination. Um, he is a very intelligent young man. He is um, very um, determined, having gone blind during his life. Uh, he's now trying very hard to make up for that, and he works incredibly hard at it. Peter is a very strong physical man, has the same type of mentality, full of fun, but determined to get there whether he busts or not. He's like a horse. He'll drop dead rather than not finish. Don't worry. Come on, up you get. Come on, there's two Swedes, a Finn and Norwegian, just gone past you. Come on. Good luck with them. Graham is a much quieter sort of person, more gentle. Um, rather the sort of person one would imagine as a first-class physiotherapist. Uh, and he is very kindly, and I think he will have the greatest problem because of determination.
Graham married Mari three years ago. He's a handyman. He's made most of their kitchen furniture. His parents instilled in him the need to be independent. I haven't been uh, mollycoddled, as it were. I, I was allowed to play with the kids in the street. I used to ride a bike, sort of three-wheeler bike, and then I, I ran somebody over, actually. And uh, <coughs> he, um, he phoned the newspaper up, and uh, the newspaper came down and took a picture. And uh, he persuaded me down to buy me a two-wheel bike. <laughs> but you couldn't see where you were going? Oh, no, but I used to, I just used to know, you know, it's just, um, I used to write, you know, my dad could say to me, oh, ride right up to the big house on the corner and come back. And I'd just got to ride along, get up to the big house, turn the bike round and come back again. And I could stop right outside my door as well, you know. Peter lives at home in Romford with his mother, father and brothers. As far as is possible, his is a handicap ignored rather than accepted. There's not a thing that's talked a lot about in this house. There's no need to talk about it. Well, I feel there's no need to talk about it. But there are frustrations. I mean, sometimes you get the urge, oh, I'd like to run out, jump in that car and, you know, go out for a spin, you know, say waiting for a bus that ain't going to turn up or, you know, something like that. But you know you can't do it, so you just blot it out of your mind and keep walking. Peter, Graham and Mike have been friends since they were at school together. Now they all belong to a club they formed themselves, the Metro Sports Club. Mike's the chairman. There are sighted members as well as blind. For Mike, blinded at ten, it's been a struggle to come to terms with disability. But it's had its humorous side. Shaving cream on a toothbrush, um, things like that, eating plastic cars and Kellogg's cornflakes and things like that, you know, that plopped out onto the cornflakes that you didn't see, which you normally would have spotted. Sterilised milk bottle top I crunched up once. Um, all sorts of things like that. Um, I once sat at the end of a tie and I thought it was a tough piece of steak. And as the more I cut, the more the table shook and the glasses rattled. And the people were just so embarrassed, they just sort of sat there and coughed and fidgeted. And I thought, well, you know, they were offered to help me cut this piece of steak in a minute, and they didn't, and they just got more and more embarrassed. In the end, I went red and said, well, I'll you know, give it up. Put the sort of knife and fork at sort of five, got sat back and had something slap me in the chest. <laughs> and it was the end of the tie with gravy dripping down it. And, you know, at, the, at that point, you know, I thought, oh, what have I done? And I sat back and I said, got hold of the end of the tie and squeezed it in the plate and said, I'll eat that later. <laughs> and everyone fell about laughing. Mike married Maureen in 1972 after a two-year courtship. How did you meet? Well, to coin a phrase, he was blind drunk at the time <laughs> and I had to take him home. He came to the office party where I worked and uh, he was miles from home. His brother near, lived not far from me. So about three o'clock in the morning, we were stuck at Clapham Common and uh, I had to get a taxi and take him home. That was the first time we'd actually met. Love at first touch, we called him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd had a number scribbled down on an envelope and half the office sort of dragged me to the phone and actually dialed the, the number because I was so embarrassed. I thought, you know, she'd never want to see me again after that. And uh, phoned up and sort of, sort of, hello, hello, and she said, um, uh, I said, you got home all right? And she said, yes. And I thought, you know, well, do I ask her out again or not? She didn't sound sort of hostile, so I said, well, do, 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 you know, do you fancy coming out again? And, you know, she sort of said yes, and that was it. Being blind must uh, cause difficulties. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, with the opposite sex, I mean, for a start, you can't see what you're getting. You use your nose a lot. I mean, if you've got good perfume on, you got to give it a good sniff, you know. Which is embarrassing. I asked a bloke with aftershave on once to dance with me, but, <laughs> you know. Mike and Peter and Graham play football at least once a week. They do so with a ball that contains weights that rattle so that they can estimate where it is. Graham is an Arsenal supporter. He has a reputation as an uncompromising player. When you play football, they call you clogger. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I always try and play the ball, but uh, sometimes they pass it before I get to them. <laughs> yeah, um, I enjoy playing football. I, I suppose I do play a bit hard, but, uh, 
You've got to win the ball, haven't you? <laughs> of the three, Peter's the most aggressively self-sufficient. I can walk where I want to go, you know, I just go where I want to go. Independence? Yeah, I suppose so. Call it like, call it what you will, but I'd, that's how I'd sooner be. I don't... No, I don't like that much help. Do you resent it if people try to give you help? No, I never resent it. If I if they say one out to get on the train, I say yep. If they want to walk me to a bus stop, I say yep because it takes a strain off me for you know thirty seconds, four minutes, whatever it happens to be. And it is a strain. Yeah, not many. Well, um, I'm a piano tuner, and uh, when you're trying to combat the sound of the traffic when you're walking along with your ears. Uh, your ears have took such a battering out there that they're not really uh, in tip-top condition to tune a piano. Can I take the coat for you? Yes, please. How are things? All right. Yeah? Good. <sighs> Cheers. Can you manage OK? Just thanks. Peter was taught to tune and string pianos when he left school. Of the 15 men on the course at that time, four were blind. They learned as quickly as the sighted students. Peter works with method and patience, and as he says, it's a contrast to his attitude to most other things. He couldn't be bothered to learn to play the piano, for instance. That's it. Do you read Braille? I can read it, but I've, I've probably only read about <laughs> 10 pages of it since I left school, if, if that. Why don't you bother? Is it's it too laborious. No, it's too laborious. It's a, it's a cross the page, back, turn over the page. Oh, yeah, it just gets on your nerves. So I don't bother. If I need to read anything, I'll get a talking book. And uh, that reads to me. Graham works as an audio typist in the city. Despite the fact that he's a qualified computer programmer, he's tried and failed to get a job on computers 76 times. He was never even granted an interview. Are you ever bitter? No, never. You said that quickly. Um, I, well, I presume you mean about being blind. Mm. No, it's, I, I, I've accepted it, and to me it's the normal way of life, you know. I, the, the only thing I've ever been bitter about in my life was that I couldn't get a job. Uh, what I'd been trained for. It's a good office to work in, you know. People there are good, the atmosphere is good. To, but, you know, it's it's just the thought of doing that self-same job for another 37 years. What do you want from people who associate with you every day, who meet you? And... Um, I think you know, it's easy to say the words. I mean, acceptance, um... I don't necessarily mean acceptance as an equal. Um, I mean, I'm different, as different from you as the next person is. So, you know, I want to be accepted as Mike, who happens to have a disability, rather than being dis accepted as disabled Mike, which is, you know, slightly different. Mike also started as an audio typist, but he wasn't satisfied, and now he's training as a social worker. You just said, George, have you got any threes? It's Karen's goal. You're going to lose for eight weeks. He's worked at a children's home in Camden. At one time, I really did feel that I had to prove that I was as good as a sighted person. That I was a sighted person, really. But it's just that my eyes weren't fo you know, focusing that well. What? No, I wouldn't mean perfect. I just, I'm just brilliant, you know. <laughs> I do social work now, um, not worrying about whether I can do it as good as the next person, but whether something's coming from it, irrespective of whether I was blind, deaf, or had one leg. Are you bitter at the deal life has made to you? No. I, um, I think I can be very honest there in, in many ways. I, I've done much, much more, I think, than probably I would have done if I could see. Uh, I mean, I was in the East End, and all sorts of things could have influenced me from there, you know, from sort of a, quite a very working-class type background with lots of mates in trouble. I mean, I was caught nicking stuff from Woolies and things like that when I was about nine. So, I mean, all sorts of things could have happened. Peter likes to gamble. Horses, dogs, or the cut of the cards. He goes to the Greyhound track with his brother. Horse moving up, one stone bombing half, we've got no chance. Two 
it? Probably. I just like the wind. Oh, I love that. I say, go on, my son. Oh, yeah, I just love it. I love, just love getting the winner. It's uh, something that I, I enjoy. I enjoy the thrill of it, you know? With a dog, he's running really fast towards the line, isn't he? And if he's just half a length down with, you know, 30 yards to go, he's in just seen creeping up on the inside like you know and he's just oh as they flash over the line at that speed you just got his the other dogs are just in front you know <laughs> when he's out i worry over him but not because he can't see just because he's my son and all mums worry i haven't got a special reason to worry about him well, you, because, have really, uh, you have really, because you might at the very least walk into something. Um, well, no, he's very, he's very, very confident. Mm. I know I might be doing a bit of bragging now, but he's good. <laughs> Ma now leads from he's fast, isn't he? Here he comes. That, 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 this yeah. must be Stem up now, already. And this is faster. Yeah, that's him. He's done it all, he's still. In what he's achieved. Has he surprised you with what he's achieved? Oh, Christ, yes. No doubt in my mind. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, longer, 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 come on. The running, the weight training, the striving for peak fitness is over. Despite the powdering of snow today, all winter there's been no fall heavy enough for them to practice on. They go to Sweden having skied on snow a total of between seven and ten days in the whole of their lives. Come on. But Peter and Graham and Mike are ready. They've done all the hard work now, like any good athlete. The Alan Pascoe's, the Brendan Foster's of the world, their training, their hard time, their stress time is working up to the competition. Actually, when they get to the competition, it's merely a psychological as opposed to a physiological problem. Are they going to win anything? I honestly don't know. I haven't seen their competition. I think theirs is the real Olympic motto. Just to have taken part will be the greatest thing. For In Schleswig, Sweden, 300 miles north of Stockholm, last Friday afternoon. Among the competitors on this charter flight, the British team of six. It's put the British Ski Club for the Disabled 1,200 pounds in debt to get them there. Hello. On the ice. Unschulzweig welcomes the competitors from 17 different nations. The blind, the partially sighted, the amputees, each in separate competitions. The next day is the only one the teams will have to practice on the course and to get to know their Swedish guides. The relationship with the guide is vital. He's the eyes of the blind skier. With his hair specially trimmed for the occasion, Peter sets off first. Next one. All right. Good luck. On that morning's practice, the day before the race, a short, steep hill near the start caused the British problems. Let him go. Let him go. Good. Not bad. There's four people telling me left and right. One person. You, you tell me left and right, right? Mike went back to the top to try again. Sit down. Sit down. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Veered off to the right. Yeah. So I got him. Nervous? Not. If I don't hit many more of the uh, wooden planks and things like that, I don't think I'll be too nervous, no. How about the, uh, how are you getting on with the guide? How's that working out? Very well, Pez, doing very well. We're uh, just, just gradually working lefts and rights and getting the downhill section sorted out on me. And, um, you know, making sure that uh, everything's sort of okay for the racing, the tracking and things like that. So we're just getting to sort of understand each other. So Mike went back to try a third time. And this time, it was the guide who had the problems. Right. Graham, too, found himself in difficulties on a hill near the start. Have you fallen over? Oh, yeah, I did a beautiful triple somersault at the bottom the first time <laughs> round. <laughs> but you're all right? Uh, well, yeah, it helps to cool you down, doesn't it, the snow? <laughs> How about um, uh, your guide? Are you finding that you're settling down now? Um, well, we got a little bit difficult. You can see he doesn't speak any English. Is it possible for you to... to to guide quite happily? Yes. yes. The language is difficult. Mm. 
think you'll need a translator. Yes. You don't take a translator around with you. <laughs> the race is tomorrow. Are you nervous? No. You seem very sure. Positive, in fact. You know, I, I told you early on that uh, you don't know how good they are, so you don't expect to win, so the pressure's just not on at all. You just go out there and do your best. Monday morning. There are 26 entrants for the 15-kilometre race. All but the British have trained in alpine conditions. Number 41, Peter Young, Great Britain. Three, two, one, go! Come on! Four minutes later, number 49, Mike Brace, Great Britain. And four minutes after that, number 56, Graham Salmon, Great Britain. When I make a mistake, then everything that John Moore says to me has come back. I say to myself, steady boy, keep your head in line with your body and keep it straight and push with the leg and it all comes back. Mike, 15 minutes into the race. You've got to go on, you've got to go on. There's another person coming up, the next bend's coming up. You're, you're going on, you're going on. All the time you're thinking, what's coming up? Already coming up was Graham. You have to be alert. You, know, you can't afford to fall asleep on your skis. <laughs> on the second lap, the hill near the start that caused so many bruises in training. Conditions were so difficult on this hill, the guides were now permitted to steer the skiers. All the British boys got down it unscathed. Nine kilometres, Peter's been skiing more than an hour. I feel great, you know, I don't feel tired, or just my legs say they're a bit tired, my arms are not tired, I can push all day. Your stomach's coming up in your mouth, your ears are pounding, your feet ache, but it's worth every minute of it. You know, you're sort of absolutely at the end of your tether, and yet you're pushing and pushing and pushing. Mike was tiring, Graham was catching up. When you start getting tired, then um, you tend to think about, God, I wish this was over, I don't know why I ever started it. About halfway around the last circuit, I felt like giving up, but I knew Mick was just in front of me. Ooh. 10 kilometres, the end of the second lap. Peter's eager not to be disqualified. He shrugs off any offer of help. But after the fall, his guide is out of earshot. Peter has a whole third lap of five kilometres still to complete. By now, Mike has got his second wind. But he's still being hard-pressed by Graham, who's becoming worried about overtaking. And you listen to what's going on around you. If you hear somebody come in behind and you, you fall, then you know you've got to move pretty quick. Seven, three, Getting back in his tracks again wastes precious seconds. Peter is now within half a mile of the finish. This is the long last hill on the circuit. Peter's been skiing for one hour and 35 minutes. Even he is tired. This time, it's a real effort to pick himself up. The cheers tell him he's near the finish. Peter 
Peter was placed 22nd in a class of 25. His time, one hour, 40 minutes. He was thirsty. He decided he'd earned a drink. We can't get a drink then, babe. Yes, we've got a drink. I've got a drink with that, babe. I'll come back in a minute with that. We almost have a drink. We've got a drink. We've got a drink. We've got a drink. Look at the time, Joe. This is stupid, though. I should have just walked with them like this. Oh, I won't. Not when I've just raced. I'll go and get my drink. I won't. I'm just thirsty. Now you'll go and get your drink. Go on. Put the other one on while we're bugging about. No, I haven't got a drink. Oh, gee, I ask you. Into the goal is arriving Mike Brace from Great Britain. Keep saying left, right, left, right, up, 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 and sort of swear at my legs and my arms to, to get a move and just keep going, 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 and going, going until you got there. Mike finished 24th in one hour, 48 minutes. And arriving at the goal is Graham Salmon. Graham, exceeding his coach's expectations, made up two minutes on Mike to finish 23rd. His time, one hour, 46 minutes. Well done, well done. Oh. More drink? More drink? Well done, well done. Drink for you, Graham. Thank you very much. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Worse than you thought? No, the, the, uh, the first still going up. I feel I've over on it every time. But that was the only place that was difficult, really. Worth it? Oh, no, no, i No medals for you? I shouldn't think so. I've awarded myself one, and uh, I should be quite happy with that. Yesterday, Mike and Graham and Peter were racing again, over 10 kilometres. They all improved their placings. They all completed the course. <laughs> Tackle, 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 tackle